Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Every day, there are countless books and articles that are published offering the key on how to make your business a success. It's easy to feel overwhelmed trying to keep up and run your business. That's why Deb Creer created the Business Power Hour. Keep up on the latest trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. Let the Business Power Hour do the heavy work for you. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about giving professionals the tools that they need to make themselves and their businesses as successful as possible. And today we're going to be talking about that thing that we absolutely positively have to do to make our businesses successful, and that's sales. I mean, you know, we might have the greatest thing in the world, but if nobody buys it, it's not going to do any good. But we always go, ooh, sales. Oh, I don't want to do that. And I promise. My guest today is going to give us so many great tips and information on how to make this something that we enjoy doing and more importantly, is beneficial and make sales, right? You know, that's the important part. So please join me in welcoming Amanda Holmes to our program today. Welcome, Amanda. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here, Deb. We're going to have so much fun. So let me tell people a little bit about you and then we will jump into this. So Amanda Holmes is the CEO of Chet Holmes International, which has worked with over a quarter of a million businesses worldwide. At age 24, Amanda inherited her father's multi-million dollar enterprise, which specializes in helping companies double their sales. She merged her father's proven process with her own forward thinking ideas to connect the old school sales process with hybrid online and offline instant gratification, short attention span that we see of consumers today. Based on Chet Holmes' New York Times bestseller, The Ultimate Sales Machine, which was voted in the top 10 most recommended sales books of all time, Amanda's mission is to teach the last and most important lesson that her father never got to reveal to radically change the lives of those passionate about success and sales. So again, Amanda, welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Deb. Well, I always like to know from my guests how they got to where they are today. And I know that your journey was different than what you thought it would be 10 years ago. So, you know, tell us a little bit about how it is that you got to where you are today. Yes, uh, rather unexpected. So I was a singer-songwriter similar to you we were both uh, in the arts mm -hmm. um I went to college for music I had just released my fourth record wow and uh, then my father became ill with mm -hmm. cancer mm -hmm. and we spent a year and a half uh just being a caregiver for him mm -hmm. and trying to find an alternative to mm -hmm. his cancer and ultimately he ended up passing in 2012 and it's so interesting. So he spent 352 nights in the hospital, never once. Wow. So he, and none of those nights did he spend alone. It was between me, my mm -hmm. mother and my brother. We did right. all nighters with him every night. I love that. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Very supportive. And yet never once did we sit down and say, Hey, Amanda, <laughs> these are my companies. Mm -hmm. These are who runs my companies. Right. This is what I want to see mm -hmm. with the future of my company. Mm -hmm. We never had that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so when he passed, and then I, I guess, inherited his company. They mm -hmm. just said, okay, here, give her the role of chairwoman and, you know, we'll continue on. And you're like, but, but I sing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted nothing to do with mm -hmm. it. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. was so far from knowing what to do with the business. And, uh, but um, two years later, after of trying to find different C-suites to fill the void that my father left, I eventually stepped into CEO and here I am eight years later. I love it. And obviously very successful, um, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the thing is sometimes life doesn't go the way we planned, but you took it and went, okay, we're going to make this work. <laughs> much, <laughs> much to my hesitation at first, right. I must right. say oh, yeah. there was, yeah. you know, I, I study under an Indian saint. 
Um, and her nonprofit is called Divine Bliss International. Mm-hmm. I call her Guruji. And mm-hmm. she was the one that kept, just kept saying, you can step in, you can be CEO, you can carry this forward, you can do it. And I kept looking at her like, you've got to be kidding me. But I sing. <laughs> <laughs> singer do you mm-hmm. know that right mm-hmm. i could sing them a sonnet but i don't mm-hmm. think that i could right help and, and sales dilemmas. oh my gosh mm-hmm. yeah. you know and and i mean that's the thing is it, when when pretty much anybody says sales they make the face right Ugh. i don't yeah. want to do sales Ugh. you know so not only were you doing sales you were going to teach sales you were you had to sell sales um I you know that. and and but it's it's such an interesting journey and process because you know I, I love what we said in your bio about it was the old school sales techniques which were obviously very successful your father's programs were very very successful um and but you know it was it was time to bring it into this century where people want instant gratification you know we all fussed when Amazon couldn't do overnight during the first part of COVID, right? You know, I'm like, oh, what do you mean it's going to take two days for me to get something? Um, <laughs> you know, we really want it. We want it now, whether it's information, whether it's a product, whether it's a service, we want it now. And if we don't get it, we publicly go online and go, oh my God, this is horrible. You know, and, and, but we all, you know, I've, I've had people on the program before. We've talked about the fact that if you are a business owner and even pretty much any employee in a company you are in sales Dang. and you know and and so stop making the faces you know we need to learn how to do this in a way that is is you know very profitable and um and easy you know and and so i was reading your information and was struck by the fact that you know, I was reading it thinking, well, duh, that makes sense. <laughs> you know? But mm-hmm. at the same point, it was like, well, why hadn't I thought of that? Well, it's interesting that you say that. So my father was the ultimate sales machine, mm-hmm. right? That's the name of the book. And he mm-hmm. was just a living, breathing embodiment of that. And yet he hated being called a salesperson. Right. Mm-hmm. And his whole methodology and what I've carried on today, mm-hmm. his legacy is this concept that Um, He actually, I found this letter that he had written where he had called it the death of the salesman, Mm -hmm. birth of the strategist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the new emergence of, well, it's not a new emergence, the last Mm -hmm. decade of Amazon, Mm -hmm. right? 97% of prospects feel that salespeople are too pushy today. Mm -hmm. So we have to change our approach to how we sell because the way that people are buying is radically different. Mm -hmm. And some businesses have caught on to that and they're Mm -hmm. seeing great success and others are having a little bit slower time to pick up to the way in which buying patterns have changed. Right. You know, and and we, we all have these images of the salesperson in our head. It's, you know, you, you, you want to buy a new car and you get pounced on by eight people. You know, you go to a, a store and you get squirted with perfume. Um, you know, mm-hmm. All of these various things. And so many times we're at that stage where we either A, aren't even interested. Now, granted, if you've gone into a car dealership, you're probably at least somewhat interested. But yeah, in many cases, we're not actively looking for that information. Um, you know, and even if we're actively looking for it, we don't want to be sold to. I, I, yeah, I'll back you up with the, some market data. So um, 10 years ago, the average person to go buy a car, they would go to six different dealerships mm-hmm. before making a buying decision. Right. Today, they go to, on average, 13 websites, right. and only mm-hmm. 1.8 dealerships. Mm-hmm. Yes. So much more of that buying decision decision mm-hmm. is happening online right. and 80% of your prospects would rather discuss on mm-hmm. social media than talking to a salesperson. Right. Mm-hmm. So we really have to think, how are we giving the information that mm-hmm. they're already going to look for mm-hmm. online so that when that salesperson does have the opportunity to talk to them or even e-commerce, mm-hmm. it's so much easier mm-hmm. to have that uh, dialogue. Right. I mm-hmm. even... Um, one of my friends, uh, Frank Kennedy, he's one of the number one used car salesmen in the United States. Mm-hmm. He sells 186 cars a month, which wow. you know anything, right. That's you like know anything. for a day. <laughs> Did I well, do the, math right? yeah. <laughs> the average car salesman sells 
10 cars a month and he right. sells 186. And I interviewed him on it because I just found it fascinating. You know, the epitome of the used car salesman, right. like, mm-hmm. it, you know, you say so uh, people, it, people don't think so fondly. And yet he says, you know, it's actually not me. I hate to break it to you. It's not me that sells the cars. It's my community. Mm-hmm. So he has a very active Facebook page right. mm-hmm. where he posts about mm-hmm. the different cars that he has mm-hmm. and he just puts them up on there and he goes, who's next? And then people start commenting mm-hmm. who they think would love that car oh, and people start tagging mm-hmm. each other. Yeah. And this yeah. Hey, Bob, process. you've been looking for. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which is such a great showing of how salespeople can change their approach mm-hmm. today by utilizing online. I mean, mm-hmm. salespeople who use social outsell their peers by mm-hmm. 78%. Right. Yeah. You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of realtors who even during COVID couldn't figure out how to not have open houses. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that's how you sell a house. You have people come, you have them walk through and, you know, and, and when you're not doing the open house, you're scheduling tours and all of those things. Well, we spent 18 ish months, depending on where you were and, and all sorts of things with that not happening, you know, and, and so online was the only option. And it was so interesting to see how they, you know, even, even the, the initial concept of, wait a minute, you mean I need to take a really good picture, a video? You want me to do a walkthrough video? And so talking to, to uh, realtors was so interesting because, of course, those who got it survived. Those who didn't are now doing something else. Yep. Uh, so pre-COVID, the average company would take them five to seven years to get their marketing and sales process mm-hmm. online. Post-COVID, it's now 1.5 years on average. Mm-hmm. So the right. amount of innovation that happened mm-hmm. in such a short period mm-hmm. of time is so, so shocking. Mm-hmm. And yet now we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we actually optimize this? Right. Because just because I'm online doesn't mean that I'm actually mm-hmm. getting the ROI that I'm looking for. Right. Yeah. You know, and so many people still want to kick the tires um, and, you know, see the rooms. And, you know, I, I never, I, my online shopping did not change during COVID. You know, it, it was the same as, as it always was. You know, my husband went and did the grocery shopping because I um, have an immune problem. And so, you know, he went to the grocery shopping. That was great. I, I didn't set foot in a grocery store for months, um, which that to me was fantastic. But so we mm. didn't do any online grocery shopping. I certainly didn't do online clothing besides, you know, a couple of t-shirts here and there like I normally would. So I was kind of that anomaly. But, you know, it, there are people who are like me. They still want to see the items. So we have to have this combination of in-person and online. And I think that's where so many places are struggling. Absolutely. I will just back you up on that. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it really, it, because they can't figure it out. You know, the, it, how do you deal with the person, the car person who, you know, looked at 18 different websites and went, okay, this is my list. And so then they go to the dealer and they hand them the list and they say, here's what I want. And the dealer's like, that's not what I have. <laughs> you know? And so, of course, then the situation is, how does that salesperson in the car dealership handle that? Do they say, we're sorry, we don't have that? Or do they work with them to show them something else? And that's, of course, the key. Yes. Uh, a Frank Kennedy would tell you that you just are there to serve them. And if they want a car, then you get them a car. Right. <laughs> so. And, you know, and it's okay to tell them, we're sorry, we don't have that, you know, and, and now granted, like, especially like with car dealerships, I mean, you know, in, a, in the middle of COVID, I decided to buy a pickup. Um, and so that was very entertaining because we couldn't find them here. And some of the dealerships said, okay, there's one here, there's one here, we can get it shipped to us. Um, it was a little weird because I couldn't test drive them and, and all of that. But some of them just said, sorry, we can't get it. Mm. And I'm like, really? You're not even going to try? <laughs> um, you know, because I could go online and find it and have it shipped to right. you. I mean, that was the other weird part was I could do it. And um, but but yeah, it was it, it's it's like you said, it's it's serving them, you know, and, and sometimes though serving them and saying, we're sorry, we can't do it because then they know you're that, you know, nobody's wasting their time. Um, you know, if, if say you came in and said, I want a purple polka dot BMW, 
might not be able to do a purple polka dot BMW. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why somebody would, but, um, but yeah, it's, you know, how is it that you're going to serve them? And sometimes serving them is saying, we're sorry. Absolutely. So, you know, you've, you've got this book and, um, you know, and, and again, it's called the ultimate sales machine, obviously very popular, great information. And you decided to update it. Mm. So tell us a little bit more because, you know, this was your father's legacy. So yes. how did that process go with even deciding I need to do this? Um, you know, and, mm. and then, then how did you, you update it? Because there are so many things that, that come out that, you know, we really should think about updating them. So the publisher, since the first day that I came in, kept saying, you know, it'd be really great to get a new edition. We sell so many books. You know, it's something that uh, I really haven't put marketing dollars behind in a decade. And yet pure word of mouth, we've sell, we've sold, you know, tens of thousands of copies just because people love it so much and they refer it to their clients mm -hmm. and their staff and all of this. So it's really the the love of our clientele, mm -hmm. why it's been so successful. And um, so th they came back to me and they asked me if I would write the new edition. And mm -hmm. finally, after years, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it because, um, well, that's a whole nother s story. Mm. We've got uh, time. It's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, while my father was battling, um, mm -hmm there was a point where he got a bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. So he was locked in a room for mm -hmm. about two months, maybe. Right. He had, months. he had to go into isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, my father was six foot four. He was oh. used to traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. He was a you know world renowned speaker. Mm -hmm. He had his yacht and his Rolls Royce. I mean, just mm -hmm. he, he lived a very lavish life. Right. Mm -hmm. So then to go from that to now, you are confined mm -hmm. to a very small room. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget. There was this moment where I walked in and he was just staring out the window mm -hmm. and I came over to him. I'm like, you know, what's, what's going on? What are you thinking about? And he said, for all the wealth that I've amassed, nothing can buy my way out of this hospital room. Mm -hmm. And I just could never shake that right. moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that led me down a completely different path. So like I said, I study under this Indian saint. Mm -hmm. I name, uh, I call her Guruji. Mm -hmm. And for the last 10 years, I've been on this quest to really understand the purpose to life. Mm -hmm. Why are we really here? Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had some lovely epiphanies. I'm far from knowing the, all the answers, but I think mm -hmm. I've, I've dug to the depths of that deeper mm -hmm. than I think more than the general population, let's mm -hmm. just say. Um, so there were several years where I shaved my head and lived in robes and just renounced earthly possessions, mm -hmm. ran my company for one day a week while spending that time serving mm -hmm. in a healing center. So mm -hmm. just very intense. I went down right. that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I uh, took, took the blue pill. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to bring that to more people. I mm -hmm. wanted to share right. that understanding mm -hmm. of what is what is the truth about wealth and mm -hmm. success and how does that tie in the intersection of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And so I finally said yes to the book deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I reached out to everybody and said, okay, guys, what would you like to see in the new edition of the book? The response was, don't change it. It's perfect. Right. Why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit pressurizing. I thought, mm -hmm. oh, okay. So the first year, year and a half, mm -hmm. when I would just make a small edit, like for instance, when my father first wrote the book, the word website was two words. Right. That yeah. And to... now it's one word, not and capitalized, all that good. Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> Little things like that. Faxing. Mm -hmm. We don't really do so much anymore. So we email, I went through. We text. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started making those edits and it was like every time I would like I almost mm -hmm. hyperventilate to make one little change. Mm -hmm. And so as I started going through this process, I started building more confidence around mm -hmm. being able to adapt this and realizing that mm -hmm. it's not about me. It's about giving the people that read this right. book what they need to hear mm -hmm. to be able to succeed mm -hmm. in their business. And I also wanted to add a piece about life. Mm -hmm. And there was this moment um, at uh, the 
the manuscript was due to the publisher. It was four in the morning. Uh, and the way that I learned my father's business was mostly going through his old emails. Ah. Mm -hmm. Everyone would tell me, you know, your father told me that I was the best. Yeah. And, you know, your father told me this. And, and you're like, like oh. I have no idea if that's true mm -hmm. or not. So, and a lot of people lied. Mm -hmm. So right. I started going through his emails to find mm -hmm. out what he really thought about mm -hmm. people and uh, parts of the business. So I was looking through his emails, just trying to find something that I could add into the book. And then I landed upon this letter that he had written to his best friend where he had said, I've generated more wealth in the last six months than I had in the previous eight years combined. And this is what I learned. Mm -hmm. I thought I found it. Mm -hmm. I got there was it. gold. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Gold in them hills. So mm -hmm. it took me another year and a half mm -hmm. to incorporate what I had experienced, mm -hmm. seeing him go through that transformation and how that adapted to my journey over the last decade mm -hmm. and what I took from his learnings mm -hmm. and continued. Right. So that is the 13th chapter on how to live a rich and full life. And I'm calling it the encore that my father never got to get. You know, and it is, it's, <coughs> excuse me, such a tribute to him that you struggled with it. I mean, you know, because if it had been easy to, to not redo it, but to, to update it, then, you know, it, it, it might not have been such a, a, a fabulous book to start with but because it was such great information that was why it was hard to change it and it was his legacy i mean it was what he taught it was what it was how he lived you know and and to be saying okay we don't fax anymore <laughs> you know it right. sounds silly but you know i i actually came across the other day somebody was talking about faxing i'm like really you know oh okay <laughs> they must be in the medical field because yes. that's pretty um, much the only place yeah, where yeah, yeah. You, and, and that's because they you know yeah i mean it's very strange it's like okay um but but yeah it's so it, it is it's it's a tribute to him that it took you so long because you wanted to make sure that it was still his voice but the voice of this century that is a very good point. So I started off saying, I don't want my name on the cover. I don't mm -hmm. want my name anywhere. Mm -hmm. I will just write it as if he was writing it. Mm -hmm. And so the first few drafts turned out that way where I just, you know, what things didn't really make mm -hmm. sense anymore, I updated. Right. And then I hired a book coach. Her name mm -hmm. is Julianne Eason. Mm -hmm. And um, she started guiding me through the process. Mm -hmm. So one of the first meetings we had, mm -hmm. I was working on the foreword and it was, you know, dear reader as mm -hmm. normally forewords are. Right. And I, um, she said, you know what, Amanda, I was meditating and I thought it might be good if your foreword was dear dad. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and my instant reaction was no. Right. Like, it was no, like, I don't want to be telling him why I'm doing this. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It was very emotional. It was too sensitive to go there. Um, so we battled, bantered back and forth a little bit. Yeah. And then finally, I'm like, I've hired you to be my coach. How could I say no to the very mm -hmm. first request? I'll mm -hmm. do it as an exercise, but that mm -hmm. is not going in the book. Right. And uh, a few hours later, I was sitting at a restaurant in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and I just start bawling oh. as I'm eating and I pull out my cell phone and I just start feverishly typing mm -hmm. and it just downloaded mm -hmm. out of me this dear dad letter. Mm -hmm. So that starts the book, which mm -hmm. is very different from what you see in a sales book. Um, so that's a rather vulnerable start to right. the sales machine. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we went to chapter seven, which mm -hmm. was a real hardship for me because chapter seven started with the seven musts of marketing. And it talked about radio, television, and billboards. And I and went, you're like, mm, oh not so much. my gosh, <laughs> what do I do with this chapter? Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that, that's a, a start over chapter. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That chapter alone was its own book to mm -hmm. redo and, and right. rebuild. Mm -hmm. So Julie helped get the get the framework together, get the structure together right. so that people could consume it easily and effortlessly. Right. Because yeah, the, the concepts are still yeah. the same. It's just yes. the medium is different. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so how long in total did it take you from when you actually said, okie dokie, we're going to do this to I got a hard copy in my hand. 
oh, I still don't have a hard copy in my hand, <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's been four years mm -hmm. and uh, the publisher has the transcript okay. and um, yeah, people can get it for pre-sale. By the time this is launched, you can get, you can only get your copy from ultimatesalesmachine.com, mm -hmm. but uh, I will have the copy in my hand as soon as everyone else does in October. Mm -hmm. I love it. So much fun. You know, and, and it really, you know, it, especially since you, you hadn't been brought up in the business. I'm guessing, you know, every once in a while you might've gone in, but it's not like it was, you know, um, you know, Chet Holmes and daughter, <laughs> you, right. know? Um, you know, like they talk about, you know, such and such and son, you know, you weren't a big part of that business. So you just kind of had to learn on the fly. So right. what was that like? Terrifying. I bet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's a world renowned organization that mm -hmm. teaches doubling sales to companies that are more established. Mm -hmm. So everybody in companies my that we have all heard of <laughs> that as well. Yes. Uh, you know, 80 of the fortune 500 and then hundreds of thousands of businesses of uh, every shape and size. I mean, we service from startup to fortune 500, but uh, we, we, our real sweet spot is somebody that's already generating the revenue. Maybe mm -hmm. they have a few salespeople mm -hmm. and they're trying to figure out how to get to that next step mm -hmm. um, from 1 million to five, from 5 million right. to 10, from 10 million to a hundred million and beyond. Mm -hmm. Each step takes a different skill set. Mm -hmm. And once you master those skills, it takes another skill set to mm -hmm. get to the next step. Right. So what mm -hmm. got you to 5 million will mm -hmm. not get you to 10 million. Majority mm -hmm. of the time you have to shift your right. uh, yeah. skill it's, set. There is something very different when you make those, those changes. Absolutely. So here I am, right? 24, never having done any of that. And mm -hmm. everyone around me is double, if not triple my age. Mm -hmm. And our clientele are double, if not triple our, my age. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I was so nervous. I had perpetual panic attacks. Like it was mm -hmm. as if I couldn't catch my breath all day long, mm -hmm. just like perpetually right. this like, yeah, is, um, mm -hmm. I also had nightmares from watching well, that's my father. understandable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in the hospital, right. Mm -hmm. Watching somebody's mortality come over mm -hmm. their eyes is something right. you just never forget. Mm -hmm. Um, and that haunted me for several years. Mm -hmm. I would, I used to go and drive my car around Los Angeles just so that I could pull off to the side of the road. I'd sleep for a little bit, then my feet would fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So then I'd start to feel the prickling of my feet. So then I'd wake up because mm -hmm. my feet were, you know, my legs had mm -hmm. gone numb. Mm -hmm. But it gave me just enough sleep so that I could get some, but I wouldn't get a little bit more done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it just to give you an idea of it was it was terrifying, appalling. I mean, the lengths that people. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it was awful. Right. And uh, when I finally stepped in as CEO, that that as crazy as that was, it, it started to be a little bit more fun because mm -hmm. I got to be a part of marketing and sales process. Cause up until that point, it was mostly just like trying to find the right personnel, trying to figure out, um, you were just trying to learn the issues. business. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There was so much, um, mm -hmm. but handling my father's estate, all of that. So then when I stepped in, it was like, Oh, cool. I get to actually do some marketing and sales mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. I built an automated or it wasn't automated. I, I, I built a webinar to start selling our services one to many. Oh. So I'd have mm -hmm. like 400 business owners on a call, all much my mm -hmm. senior, right? And here I am, the gumption of a 26 year old mm -hmm. walking in there saying, this is how you double sales. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were able to double our coaching clients two years in a row from those. Wow. And I ran that mm -hmm. for those first two years, which was really exciting. And our marketing leads increased by 1100%. Mm -hmm. So that was also very exciting. Um, and that was a little bit more of the fun part. I didn't like so much of the other things that were just very difficult and legal. Yeah, I mean, being the being the boss is not always very fun. Yeah. So that was a little wild. <laughs> I, you know, I wonder if maybe part of the reason you were successful is that you didn't you didn't have all that other baggage. You know, you 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 hadn't been brought up in the company. It's almost like you didn't know better. You know, because so many times what we hear is, well, we have to do it this way because it's the way we've always done it. Well, you didn't know what that was. And, and so, you know, I'm, you know, I'm guessing that you had really good advisors and people like that, but you could say, you know what, let's try this instead. Um, you know, and, and that so, would be, that'd be fun. 
That's an interesting thing. So because I grew up with my father at the dinner tables, at the client meetings, mm-hmm. at, you know, every person that my father interacted with, he would always give them business advice. I, it didn't matter if they were the checkout clerk at mm-hmm. the CVS right. or, you know, the restaurant owner mm-hmm. that was Do just this trying a to little make different. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, perpetually my whole life. I So I knew his trainings just from mm-hmm. being around him right. and absorbing it. Mm-hmm. So when I got into the business and I looked around and went, well, that's not how my father would do it, or mm-hmm. that's not what should be done, uh-huh. right? Or don't you know that this is how this is supposed to be yeah. done? Mm-hmm. I Because I didn't know any better. I didn't know any right. other way that mm-hmm. business was done. I mm-hmm. only knew what I had watched right. my father do my whole right. life. So there was a part of me that actually just intrinsically yeah, understood. Kind of osmosis you, you had it that way. Mm-hmm. Better than, um, better than, some of the team where I would look around and go, you've been here for a decade. I don't understand. So that was my first thing of like, I don't want to do anything. They all know better than me. They Mm -hmm. all know more than me. Right. And there was so much to learn from everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody gave their something. Mm -hmm. But what I found is that my father was the innovator in Mm -hmm. the company. Mm -hmm. So when that innovation was gone, it took Mm -hmm. us, we had, we were running Mm -hmm. most of our ads on radio and it was six months after he passed and we were still running his same radio ad with his voice on radio after he'd Mm -hmm. passed. People were calling in going, what is your problem? Right. Yeah. And yet they're like, it's a ghost. (laughs) Right. And yet marketing didn't, couldn't figure out how to replace that or do something different Mm -hmm. with it. And well, they think, were probably scared to, you know, same right. thing. It's the legacy type of, of thing. You know, you don't want to get rid of them. Right. So that that is one thing that I think I have a gift mm-hmm. uh, similar to my father is that the innovation makes a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. I can, I understand where things could go right. just because it intrinsically, mm-hmm. I don't know, it, it, it just makes sense. Right. So there was a little bit of instinct, but mm-hmm. I think the thing, a huge thing that I had to learn drastically was getting through the limiting beliefs. So mm-hmm. that's where my teacher came in, my right. guru came in mm-hmm. because I, for a million years, I could never think that a singer would be able to do mm-hmm. any of that. And she just right. kept saying, you know, just release it. And mm-hmm. she trained me on different meditation mm-hmm. techniques to release the stress and to find my own discernment within myself because everybody was whispering in my ear, this is what right. you need to know. This is what mm-hmm. you need to know. This is what you need to know. And majority of them were just manipulative. Right. Yeah. So- <laughs> and, and many of them probably meant well, but, you know, it's like, it, many times it's like, well, I didn't ask, right? <laughs> you know, didn't want your advice here. Um, but you know, if, if you'd ask them, they would have said, well, we met well, um, you know, and, and, but they, I think, and, you know, uh, we get those little voices, you know, people telling us when we're tiny, don't, don't touch that. Don't walk into that. Don't do that. So they're wanting us to not get hurt, not to do all of that stuff. But, you know, as we get older, then they forget that we do have our own brains, um, you know, and, and let's be honest, sometimes it is a little bit, well, you're a girl. Um, <laughs> you know, we're just, you know, we'll just put that out there. Um, but it, it is, you know, there's, there's truly meaning well, and as you said, manipulating. You know, the, there's, there's a big difference. And I think some people don't quite understand when they've crossed that line. Oh, there's a lot, there's a lot in there, mm-hmm. but yes, majority of rooms. I I'm still majority of the time, the only female mm-hmm. for the most right. part. Right. Mm-hmm. And my clientele are 90% male mm-hmm. right. uh, because a lot more CEOs mm-hmm. of more established businesses. Right. I, yeah, I mean, that's like- just, you know, hello, there is that glass ceiling, um, yeah. you know, and, and it's great that it's changing. You know, I think that's, that's been one of the coolest things over the last five ish, 10 ish years to see. But I think it's also, <laughs> you know, I have my own theory that, you know, a lot of times we don't have women as leaders of companies because we're too smart to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're like, no, uh-uh. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and because it is, it is, it's a very demand. And I don't care if your company is, you know, fairly small or a giant multi-million dollar thing. I mean, there's, there's so much that that goes into it and i i really do think a lot of women are like no i i do not want to deal with that um because i you know i do have my family i have this i have this 
And, you know, it's just, and, you know, there's, there's certainly people who have said a woman can't do that, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I don't care what it is, but, you know, there, you know, there's, there's, well, you know, those people shoo. Um, but yeah, I think, I think in a lot of cases we're like, no, mm-mm, I'm not, I don't want to do that. Um, I think that's part of why during COVID we saw so many women leave the marketplace and not go back. Mm-hmm. You know, they were like, nope, mm-mm, I'm going to do my own thing um, and make my own rules and just go from there. It's beautiful. It's, it's an interesting thing what's happening with mm-hmm. men and women, right? I think yeah. that, I think mo- more than anything, we need mothers mm-hmm. and to respect our mothers because the mother is the most selfless position you could ever hold mm-hmm. in life. And that is something that is so sacred mm-hmm. and so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And our children need the attention mm-hmm. of mothers you know, they can't be raised by TikTok and YouTube, yeah. right? We need, we need, mm-hmm. we need to give our children that mm-hmm. grace to have somebody that's going to love and care for them. I, I mean, it could also be the male, which is great right. too. Oh but yeah, they need just, that that primary caregiver. We'll call we it. We need somebody. Uh, yeah. Yes. You know, and 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 you know, it, it's it. The hard part is for the women who do want to be, you know, that that business leader. And they've got the family, um, you know, and, and so how do they do that? And it's it's interesting when I interview women leaders on this program, because mm-hmm. many times, you know, they they've talked about the fact that, you know, they they stopped for a while and, you know, and and then it's then it's that challenge. You know, like I, I teach people how to uh, truly use LinkedIn as a senior executive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether you are or not, maybe that's what you want to be. And so how do you have your profile? showing that that professionalism and so you have these women who say okay i've got this 10-year block of i didn't do anything and i'm like mm. first of all you did the most important thing in the world <laughs> you know you raised your children and you you did all of these other things and i love it when women get creative and they call themselves you know the household budget i mean you know they, they come up with and, oh, I love you know some that. of the, the funnest terms and they also did things like you know be in charge of pta you know, they, they were, you know, the head of the, the church, you know, committee. I mean, all these various things, nobody just sat at home and raised the kids, you know, they, yeah. the, all these women and, you know, men too, you know, they did incredibly important things. And so it's just a matter of it, it, maybe it is, you know, thinking, you know, putting a little sales spin on it and thinking <laughs> how, you know, how do I show what I did was very, very important and I, and I wasn't just sitting at home, um, you know, and, and so it is, it's a challenge when, especially when women take time out from work. Yeah, it's, it, it I would agree. It's, it's hard. Mm-hmm. It is hard, but I, I think ultimately if we can find the respect for, I, I can't even say the respect for each other because it starts with our, the respect right. of ourselves. We have ourselves. to respect our own decision. We have to, we have to respect right. ourselves. Mm-hmm. And in that respect of ourselves, then we can learn to appreciate and respect mm-hmm. uh, those that are of the opposite sex too, because mm-hmm. the balance between men and right. women is just mm-hmm. absolutely bizarre at this yeah. very moment. And, it, and, it, and it's sad to me because mm-hmm. I think that we should just, you know, care for one another and whatever is our natural inclination, then you support them in that, whatever that may be. Yeah. You know, there's, there's obviously like a lot of strife in, in the political world right now. Um, you know, and, and, and it's one of those things that, yeah, we've, we've really drawn battle lines, you know, I think is, is, you know, and, and we're like getting way off topic here. Um, but (laughs) it, it is something that, yeah, it's 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 a weird period of time. Um, but I think at the same point, we're also seeing men who are becoming more empathetic, who are saying, you know, I don't have to be that hard. <clears throat> you know, I can I can be the the one who stays home with the kids too, and you know, and and all of those things. And, I, and so, you know, it's it's interesting to watch because, like with anything, there's positives and negatives. Mm. Absolutely. So, okay. I guess we should like get back on track, um, you know, and, and, but it, what a fun discussion. I love it when things just kind of, kind of go off topic, but you know, this does all tie in because we we're always kind of selling ourselves and what we believe in. 
Um, you know, and, and so we have to be very passionate about it and know what that is. And so when I was, you know, I, I, I read a chapter in your book that, that you provided, and it was a great chapter. And one of the things that really struck me, and it comes back to this whole thing from the very start where we go, ew, sales, mm, is that we shouldn't be thinking about selling. We should be thinking about educating. Yeah. And I love that. And, and you've already shown great examples of what we're talking about throughout this program with tossing in those statistics and, and having all that knowledge because you're not saying, well, you should buy my book because, <laughs> you know, you're saying, OK, well, hey, there's this big workforce, you know, that, that's out here. There's all these changes. And then the natural inclination is to go, oh, maybe I should buy the book, um, you know, and, and but you never sold it. You educated so talk more about that, because I think that is just such a great concept. And, you know, and, and so you've got I, I love the stadium pitch thing. I just thought that was yes. really cool and core story and all of that. And, and so, you know, jump off and tell me where you, you want to go, because Absolutely. I think it is so important to talk about educating rather than selling. Yes. So if you were, so anybody that's listening right now, so if you were in a stadium full of your potential prospects, mm -hmm. what would be the title of your talk? If you, so if you pick up the phone and if you're still dialing for dollars, or if you're posting on your social media channel, or if you are doing Facebook ads mm -hmm. or PPC, regardless of where you're marketing mm -hmm. at any given time, let's say that you market to a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that are listening, I, imagine, or if you can get out a pen and paper, this will really help you to remember this. And this mm -hmm. is something that changes people's lives. So we call it the concept that changes people's lives. So mm -hmm. if you draw a triangle and you draw a line right at the 3% of that triangle, mm -hmm. three so top. yeah, mm -hmm. just at the tip, 3% of your uh, stadium mm -hmm. or wherever you're marketing is in the buying now category. Another 7% are open to it. So they're thinking about it. Maybe they're researching it. So open to it. So now you're going to draw another three. So if you were drawing a line at 3% and then 7%, then you'd have three other sections, all 30, 30, 30. So 30% mm -hmm. think that they're just, it's just not on their periphery. They're not thinking mm -hmm. about your product or service. The next 30% think that they're not interested. And mm -hmm. the last 30% are definitely right. not interested. You want me to buy what? Mm-mm. <laughs> yeah, they have an opinion. They know mm. about what you do and they mm. don't want it. So 90% of your potential prospects are not interested in you, your product or service. If all you do is talk about you mm -hmm. and majority and here's of here's my product and here's what it can do for you. Exactly. That's what majority of advertising mm -hmm. does. This is why I'm the best. I'm different from mm -hmm. the rest. This is what makes me amazing. This I'm going to you solve your pain. <laughs> See, I'm a marketing person. We're looking for pain points. <laughs> yes. So what we can do is, so majority of people are competing with just that 3% of the marketplace. If you're talking about you, your product or service, you're competing with all your competitors against just that 3%. Mm -hmm. So what we've been teaching for the last decade mm -hmm. is lead with an education. If you mm -hmm. lead with an education, then it can get the attention of the full buyer's pyramid right. to educate them into you being the mm -hmm. only logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. Right. I love it. I can keep going if you'd like me to. Oh, yes, yes. You know, because okay. it, it, it really is. It's such a, a fascinating concept because it is very different than what we're used to. Yes. So uh, we teach this in many different ways. We have one-on-ones, we have boot camps where we train you how to do this. And then we actually do it for companies. So I have one client, we did a core story boot camp where they learned how to build their own and they sold, his name was Troy Aberly, and he sold uh, farming equipment to farmers. Mm -hmm. Now he used to just call up and say, Hey, what's going on with your farm? I'd like to talk yep, to you about, about a new tractor. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to tell you about my equipment. Mm -hmm. And that would only go so far, right? 3% of the marketplace. If he made 100 dials, he'd get three people, mm -hmm. right? Just as the buyer's mm -hmm. pyramid says. Then he crafted a stadium pitch. So what is that title to get out to the marketplace mm -hmm. on the five ways that you are potentially losing profit on your farm? The five ah. things. So then, that gets your attention, right? Right. So it gets the entire buyer's pyramid. Mm -hmm. Every farmer would want to know, well, what's making me lose profit on my mm -hmm. farm? I'd like to know. 
He used that and cold called four people that were hard nosed. They were definitely not interested mm-hmm. in their services. He led with an education where he gave that education mm-hmm. to them and he closed $8.4 million two weeks after my boot camp. Cool. No kidding. It's now mm-hmm. sold 42 million. And that was back in, we finished in January. Mm-hmm. He's now come on and he's works with my company mm-hmm. now because he had such great success. He's like, I want to help more companies right. do this. So now mm-hmm. he's our executive strategy mm-hmm. officer, but um, that's one example of farming equipment to go from, I just want to talk about my equipment to mm-hmm. let me educate you about what actually is of interest mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. Now, there's actually a system for how we've done this education because prior to my father coming out with the ultimate sales Mm -hmm. machine, it was like before the internet, Mm -hmm. right? So this idea of educating was fresh, brand Mm -hmm. new. People really didn't do Mm -hmm. content marketing before Mm -hmm. the internet. It was very Mm -hmm. rare. So my father was very different compared Mm -hmm. to everyone else. Today, we have 3.8 billion social media pages, 3.8 billion. Mm-hmm. So we went from not competing. We It was just the elite competing for the attention mm-hmm. of your prospects with radio and television. Mm-hmm. Today, we're competing with every mom, right. woman, child, mm-hmm. dog, kid, you know, mm-hmm. you name it that has a social media account. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, if everybody is putting out content today, we've lost the structure and the framework to how to turn mm-hmm. that content into sales. And statistically, it's shown that 40% of the content online reduces your probability of a sale. Right. Mm-hmm. Because we're like, it's been intrusive. It's been annoying. It's all of those. And you're like, I don't care. I will never buy from them. <laughs> So I, there's actually a framework for this, for how to craft an education that leads to you as the only logical conclusion. And we've helped more companies become number one in their industry than anybody else. I don't know anybody else that has it across so many industries for the last three decades. So I'll right. give it to you mm-hmm. if you'd like that. Would yes. you like me to explain? Mm-hmm. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Mm-hmm. You might've read it already, but I'll, I'll give it to you and then everybody else mm-hmm. that's hearing this. So since Since business has flipped on its head, since my father came out with the buyer's pyramid, Mm -hmm. I flipped, we flipped the buyer's pyramid on its head. Okay. So that same triangle that you saw before Mm -hmm. at the 3% to the 7% and the 30, 30, Mm -hmm. 30, we flip it upside down. Right. The little pointy part is at the bottom now. Yes. So now it looks like a funnel. Mm -hmm. So on the top in that big 30% to grab the entire buyer's pyramid, you want to talk about global pains. Mm. Okay. So what is something that has happened over decades of time? I'll tell you right now, here's a good example of a global pain. 85% of businesses last year were, had less revenue than they did the year before. Mm. 85%. And Mm -hmm. yet only 15% actually had a banner year. They had better profitability than when we started tracking profitability in 1948. It was the best year for profitability for that 15%. Mm -hmm. And there is something that is the differentiator between those 85 to 15. And I could share it with you. Yes. Is that not right? A great global pain to oh, show yeah. the difference, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So I, I want to know that answer. Mm-hmm. Right. And who does it ta- target? Everyone in that buyer's right. pyramid that would be that would want to know what it mm-hmm. what what made the 15% mm-hmm. difference. Then we get into more targeted pains. Mm-hmm. So targeted pains are what keeps your prospect up at night because as we know, only 3% are interested in what you have to sell. Right. Majority of the time, I hate to break this to you, and majority of my clients think that care. this is true. Right. They don't care mm-hmm. about your product or service. Majority of the time, they mm-hmm. don't. That's not what's keeping them up at night. It's mm-hmm. their wife or spouse. It's their health. It's mm-hmm. what's going on in mm-hmm. the office. It could be the recession. It could be the res- great resignation. It could mm-hmm. be so many different things. So we have to understand what the pain points are of our prospect, because if you can articulate their pain better than they can, they believe that you have the solution. Mm -hmm. And this is beyond just, I understand my product. You now are understanding your target demographic Mm -hmm. better than they ever thought Mm -hmm. you would. Right. Then we get into the next section, which is solutions. Mm -hmm. So you've put them in this pain to grab their attention Mm -hmm. because we want to cut through the clutter of all that messaging Mm -hmm. online. Now, when we have their attention, we have to provide something of value, right? Mm-hmm. We have to right. give them something mm-hmm. valuable to set to set ourselves up as a true right. expert. Mm-hmm. Because what do they want to see? They want to know you, like you, and trust you. Mm-hmm. Those are the yep. three 
qualifiers. Yeah, none of the, if that doesn't exist, you're probably not going to get anything. Absolutely. You're 65% of the way to a sale if you just build rapport and mm -hmm. find what their need is. Right. So that's what we're doing, right? We're mm -hmm. building that rapport. So once we get to solutions, then we get into the next step, which is the differentiator between content marketing and what my father taught, which is education-based marketing or what we call a core story. Mm -hmm. So that's resetting of the buying criteria. So you could do all of that education, but because you've done such a great job of educating, they'll then go to your competitor and buy right. from them. And that's not what you wanted. <laughs> Absolutely not, right? So in that education, you have to educate them on every reason why they should buy from you and nobody mm -hmm. else. And that right. has to be clearly articulated mm -hmm. in your education in all of your marketing and sales mm -hmm. collateral. Then by the time you've done all of these steps, they a artfully done core story should mm -hmm. lead them to you that they want to purchase before mm -hmm. you've even mentioned right. what your product or service is because right. of that and education. It, and you've not mentioned price. And prices of no objection. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that lead in. Yes. Yep. When you do this correctly, we have it happen in every industry that price is no longer a problem because mm -hmm. they've built themselves up as such an expert. I mean, we have a client that's a real estate broker in one of the most expensive counties in the United States, Marin mm -hmm. County. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, in San Francisco, right. in San Francisco. Uh -huh. uh, and they can charge a premium mm -hmm. in the hottest market, one of the hardest mm -hmm. markets in the United States because they lead with an education. Mm -hmm. So- Right. Uh, that is that is the core story framework for how to become number one in your marketplace mm -hmm. where price is of no objection. Right. You know, and and if price is the overriding factor, then you let them go somewhere else. I mean, you know, that's just the the you know, it's like no, you know, that's fine. You you can go to Walmart, um, you know, or or whatever it is. Yeah. If, if price really is, and and there's obviously a lot of people that that is you know, their overriding factor. Um, but, but yeah, for other things and, and the important things, we're not talking to those people, you know, the people who are, are listening to this program, they know that they've got the premier product, the premier service. And so price really is not a factor. It also, it gives you the wherewithal to be able to, even if you don't get it in the first round, because this is also a critical piece, 80% of sales are made on the fifth to 12th contact, right. and yet mm -hmm. only 10% of salespeople follow up after three mm -hmm. touches. Mm -hmm. yep. So if you have all of that material and all of that education that you know to follow up with them and continue to lead them through education mm -hmm. until they choose to buy right. is also there because mm -hmm. you have this plethora of knowledge knowledge instead of just banging on their door saying, hey, you want to buy yet? You want to buy yet? You want to mm -hmm. buy yet? Instead, it's, hey, you know, just to make sure that you're aware, this is a problem that's happening right now for people mm -hmm. that are very similar to you. And I just want you to know there's a solution for this. Here you go. Right. Right. Providing value, providing mm -hmm. value, providing value. Right. Yeah. You know, because people will buy when they're ready, you know, and, and, and I think that's the thing that so many times the mistake is, is we're going to try and force you to buy before you're ready. Mm. And, you know, and, and that's then where people go, uh, uh, nope. And, and the problem is then they don't come back when they are ready. Um, mm. you know, they went to, to somebody else. And yeah. so it is, it is just so important to just be providing that information, providing that information. And then when they're ready, you say, here we are. Absolutely. So, oh my gosh, we, we've only got about five minutes left um, and there's so much stuff. So we just have to have you on again. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things, and I know we can't get through this in, in this short time frame. Um, so I want people to, to get the book when, it's, when it comes out because you've got the, t the 12 point checklist for strategic education-based marketing. That's a little hard to say, mm -hmm. um, but it, it really is, you know, it's, it's 12 tips. And when you look through it, they're simple tips, you know, they're, yeah. they're in so many cases, common sense, um, you know, and, and things like credibility, you know, all of these things. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging people, go read the book and then we'll, yeah. we'll, then we'll chat again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's so interesting because it is hard for people. It's really hard for people starting out. Um, you know, I think I'm going to get a copy and send it to, to um, this young woman that I just talked to today bless her heart. See, I live in the South. I can say that now. Um, 
and she's she is she's just starting out and i can see so much potential in her and i'm i'm commissioning her to do something for me a piece of art and she said i'll give you a proposal and if it's not if it's not what you wanted then we'll talk <laughs> and i said okay and no mm -mm, you don't do that ever again <laughs> <laughs> and and she was kind of taken aback and i said i came to you because you're the expert and and i said and if i say nope that's too much or i you know then you say happy to see you on your way um you know and 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 it's very hard especially you know when we're starting out in business to you know when people want to negotiate and and we can always negotiate i mean you know there are certainly ways that that we can do that but but you know i was i was telling her you know you 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 are the expert you are the artist that i came to and so you're the one who's in control and i mean that she i had this very nervous giggle you know from her and 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 i said and just so you know i'm probably going to keep doing this to you <laughs> <laughs> um but but it is it's you know it, it comes back to what we were saying at the very start is it does you know we don't have to make the faces at sales we cannot succeed in business if we don't have sales doesn't matter how how fabulous our product is it's not going to happen folks you know you might get a sale here or there but who wants a sale here or there um you know and and so why not do this i love um another part of of what you talk about in the in the book is you know don't call them sales people because then we all go ew you know there's lots of different titles and you know and and let's be honest people even don't care about titles you know you just say hey this is this is deb you know yeah um and you know if they if they care about the title well okay but um but yeah you know it's there's there's so many things so you know like i said we've only got five minutes left so tell us how they find your company and specifically what the services are okay it's your yes. turn to be sales <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well uh so i'll give you some statistics here uh educate us Yes, 95% of businesses will never make it to a million in annual sales. Mm -hmm. Of that, 1.5%, I'm sorry, of that 0.08% make it to 5 million. Of that, it actually gets better at 1.5% make it to 10 million and 0.004% make it to 100 million and beyond. So the difference, like I was saying before, there are specific skills that it takes to get from 1 million to 5, from 5 million to 10, because it, it actually doesn't have to do with your product or service as much as we think it does. Uh, McDonald's, for example, is obviously not a superior burger, and yet they're the number one mm -hmm. burger seller in the world, right? right? It's, mm -hmm. it's because of their systems and their skills to grow the business, and those skills can be developed. Mm -hmm. So we teach those 12 skill sets that it takes mm -hmm. to double your sales. And just mastering one of them is usually all it needs to be able to double sales. So we train on these 12 core competencies through our book, through boot camps, through one-on-one -on -one coaching, through done-for-you services. Um, it all just depends on what your business needs to understand how to grow. And a good first place to start is howtodoublesales.com. Mm -hmm. That is a five question quiz. It takes 20 seconds to better understand what's going on in your world. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest thing holding you back from doubling your sales? You answer those five questions and we give you a free mm -hmm. training. So that's a great place to go, mm -hmm. howtodoublesales.com. And I would highly recommend picking up the book. There are a bunch of great bonuses going on with that right now. So you can pick that up at ultimate sales machine. Cool. And of course, the main site is chetholmes.com. Um, and I was looking through there, lots of great free resources, um, you know, and, and so that's, that's, you know, just such fabulous information. And so I encourage people to check out all three websites because there's different great information on each one. Mm, thank you. So, um, Amanda, if they, all of a sudden I drew a blank on your name, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. If if someone wants to contact you directly, how how is the best way to do that? Uh, I'm on all social medias. I spend majority of my time on Instagram, okay. which I am under my salsa name, Amandita mm -hmm. Holmes, because Amanda Holmes was taken. I it is a somewhat common name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Amandita Holmes. So that's a good place to reach out. Okay, perfect. I love it. Well, you know, we've, like I said, we've just scratched the surface on this. And it's so important that I think we need to, to follow up and, and talk with you again. But do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave everyone with? 
I think the most important is that at the end of your day, when you go to put your head on the pillow, if you feel that you've done a good job in your day, you're the only one that will know that. And everyone's opinion of what that is for themselves is different. And if you know what's going to make that difference between you feeling good about yourself or not, you have the ability to change that. So to me, the mark of success is knowing that you can enjoy and appreciate and be grateful for yourself based on your own measure of what that is. And it should be how you feel about yourself. So I would leave that as the most important. I love that. That is, that is absolutely perfect. I'm Deb Creer. I've been talking with Amanda Holmes, the CEO of Chet Holmes International. Can't wait to do it again. And until next time, everyone have a great day. Tune in for our next program for even more trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. The Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer, is proud to be part of the C-Suite Network.